living a healthy, balanced life is no small feat, especially when you're a mom. With meals to cook, laundry to load, work to do, and humans to raise, it can be easy to feel like we're in an on-again, off-again relationship with healthy living. But it doesn't have to feel this way. I believe living a healthy life has become way too complicated. What we need isn't a new plan or program telling us what to eat or how to live. We need simple, uncomplicated routines and information that's going to help us live our best, most beautiful life without rules and restrictions. Join me, Kristen Dovniak, holistic health coach, certified intuitive eating counselor, and mama of two for weekly conversations on what it means to live a healthy, balanced life, uncomplicate eating, and simplify in every area of mom life. Hey friends, welcome back to the Healthy Balance Mama podcast. Chris here, and today I'm sharing something a little bit different than my usual content over here on the podcast, but so many of you were interested in hearing about my marathon journey this time around, my training, and how the race went that I thought I would do kind of a whole recap for all of you on my training for the marathon, how the marathon went and just share with you guys a little bit more about how that journey went. I've talked a little bit here on the podcast about my journey with exercise and running, and I have a whole episode all about my running story that you can refer back to. I will post the link to that down below. But it is currently the day after I just finished my second marathon. So I thought today would be a good day to really sit down and reflect with you on on training and about achieving that goal and achieving a really big goal as well, one that I will share with all of you in just a little bit. So for, for those of you who don't know, I have been a distance runner for a about 16 years now. I'm 32. And I really started distance running when I was 16. I ran my first full mile without stopping when I was 15. And I quickly got into running and I didn't last very long in that like three to four mile range. I trained for my first 10 miler. There's this really awesome local 10 mile race called the Blessing of the Fleet in Narragansett, Rhode Island. It is a beautiful flat course that goes right down by the ocean. And that was my first ever distance race. And so after I ran that 10 miler that first time around, I was hooked. I loved the training for and the building up the miles and really achieving that goal of running beyond just those everyday weekday runs, but really achieving that distance. 10 miles felt like such a big deal. And it is a big deal. Any of you who have trained for and run 10 miles, that is a big deal for almost anyone that's over an hour of running, which is a lot of time on your feet. And so it was a really fun accomplishment. And I continued to do that race every year. And eventually started increasing the amount that I did. Of course, if you listen to my whole running journey, there was a lot of ebbs and flows. And many of you know my story um, when it comes to my history of disordered eating and exercise was a part of that. And so I had to tread lightly kind of along that journey as well. So there were definitely ebbs and flows. It wasn't kind of like an uphill climb from starting off distance running when I was 16 to where I am now at 32. There was there was a lot of ups and downs and training cycles throughout all of that, but I didn't start training for my first half marathon until 2016. Um, so it was the year before I got pregnant with my second daughter. Um, so in between my two daughters, I decided to train for my first official half marathon. So I had run a half marathon before on my own, but actually training for and running my first official half marathon I did with a few friends in 2016. And I completed that in just a little bit over two hours which is a great time for a first-time half marathoner, I thought, at least. I'm not an elite by any means. I actually just watched the 2021 Boston Marathon this morning, and the winner, the male winner of the Boston Marathon, won it in like 2.08, the entire marathon. So my half marathon time was on par with the winner of the full marathon, the elite winner, that is. Um, So, you know, but it was a great time for me. I felt really good about that. And I At that point, I knew in the back of my mind that I would love to run a marathon at some point. However, 
up until that point, and really even at that point, I had actually just finished a fitness competition just a few months prior. And I was in pretty good overall shape, but definitely not endurance athlete shape. Um, And I knew that my body wasn't strong enough to run a marathon at that point. I was actually in the process of I just learned that I have PCOS, which is a hormonal condition. I can also link those episodes about my hormone balance journey um, in the show notes as well. But I just learned that I had PCOS and I was kind of working on healing my PCOS in those early stages. Um, And the naturopath I was working with actually recommended I take a break from endurance training, which was a really good idea for me at the time. I really needed to reduce my cortisol levels. Cortisol is your stress hormone and kind of take a break from that to give my body a little bit of a break because I had put my body through a lot doing the fitness competition and then doing some endurance running. And so from that point after doing, I did a 10 miler and then a half marathon. Um, I took a break to heal um, and also to heal my relationship with food. It had been, you know, a really long and winding journey for me when it came to food. And I was really ready to put my relationship with food um, at the forefront, um, really having a positive relationship with food. And so taking a break from running at that point and, um, and I didn't take a break from running entirely, but really kind of slowing down on the running. Uh, It actually kind of coincided with the winter time as well. And then I got pregnant with my second daughter in 2017, early 20, like spring 2017. And so I did continue to run a little bit at that point. And after spending several months really working on my relationship with food and movement, I felt really good about training for another 10 miler, a local 10 miler. And I did end up completing a 10 miler while I was pregnant with my second daughter, which is crazy. I did not do that with my first daughter. Um, But I did start experiencing some hip pain and um, just the way that she was kind of positioned and growing in my pelvis. I ended up with some hip pain that's actually still ongoing. It's something I really have to be careful about these days. Um, But so I kind of took a little bit of a break, did that 10 miler, and then really took it easy during my pregnancy. And then after I had Ren, my second daughter, I decided a few months later that I wanted to start training for something bigger. At first, I thought it was going to be a half marathon. And then as I started running and as I started training, I realized that despite being about six months postpartum, I was the healthiest that I had ever been. And in, in in my entire time as a runner, I was no longer struggling with disordered eating. I had a really healthy relationship with food. My body was healthy and strong. And I decided that I wanted to train for a full marathon. And I think the people around me thought it was a little bit crazy because I still was postpartum at that point. I mean, we're all postpartum. Every one of us who's had a baby were postpartum for the rest of our lives, but it was still pretty early postpartum. Um, But I started slowly increasing my mileage. I decided to take it really easy. My only goal was to finish the marathon. That was my only goal the first time around in uh, 2018 when I ran my first marathon was to finish it. And so that was a goal that I was able to achieve, to accomplish. I finished it in just a little bit over four, not a little bit over four hours, four hours, 22 minutes and 40 seconds, which is a pretty good time in my mind for a first marathon. But really the biggest accomplishment was that I did it from a place of really loving the journey and really loving the training and exercising. Yes, it was exercise. It is exercise. But doing it from a place of loving the sport and not from a place of trying to change my body or fix my body or force my body to do something that wasn't enjoyable. It was from a place of joy. And that was really special because I had been told a lot of times, and I go into this more in my whole running journey, but I had been told many times that running wasn't good for me, that, you know, running was going to lead to more disordered habits or that running wasn't good for my hormones or that running wasn't good for my digestion or as a bodybuilder, running wasn't something that I should do because I would get too lean and I would lose muscle mass and all these things. But all the while, I love to run. Running is something that I do for fun. It isn't something that I do because it's not even something that I do for exercise. A side benefit is that I don't have to work out when I'm running because I'm already getting that physical activity in. I do it as a hobby. I do it for fun. I do it for the love of the sport. And so being able to accomplish that sort of a goal that so few people do was really huge and really awesome. Um, But I also knew that it was a lot on my body. I had a baby the year before. I ran a marathon and I really wanted to take a break. 
um, just to take care of my body. And so I took the year off in 2019. Uh, I ran a half marathon, um, but that was all I did in 2019. And then I decided that I wanted to start training for a marathon in 2020, uh, which I like mildly started training for hopeful. I did some hopeful training kind of as the pandemic was really at its height in May was when I kind of started training for it and quickly realized that the pandemic wasn't going away anytime soon. And then they canceled the marathon that I was going to do, the one that I ended up doing this year. And so I stopped my training. I did do a little half marathon myself. I wanted to see if I could beat my previous time, which I did. I timed myself and did a half marathon in 2020. And that was kind of fun to be able to do. Um, But I really do love racing. I love the the whole the feel of having other people there and racing shoulder to shoulder, even though I only race against myself. I'm not someone who's trying to race against other people. I love the energy of being in a group and running with a group and the crowd. And like I get like so excited just thinking about it. I love it. So I missed that aspect in 2020. And so I started thinking about training for a marathon in early 2021. But early 2021 also coincided with a really, really difficult time in our family, which I have mentioned several times before. However, I haven't gone into details, um, and the time will come when I go into details about that, but it's still not quite the time. Um, So it was one of those things where I was like, okay, I'm going to start training, but I'm not sure not sure if it's going to happen. But I decided to talk to my mom and talk to my husband and kind of figure out a schedule to see if this was something that I would be able to do despite my husband's crazy schedule um, with his sailing and, you know, being a solo parent for a lot of the time. It looked like it was going to work. And so I started training um, and I officially started training about 15 weeks prior to the marathon in June. Uh, anywhere from 12 to 16 weeks is usually kind of like a typical training cycle for most marathoners or well, I shouldn't say most marathoners, at least most kind of average marathoners. I don't know if there's such a thing. Not not elite marathoners. And so I thought 15 weeks was a good amount of time. Um, I was already pretty fit from just keeping up my cardio. I loved doing the Peloton bike a lot last year. Um, the awesome co-working space that I go to for my youngest daughter. Any of you who are local, uh, shoot me a DM or an email. I'll let you know where her school is because it's incredible. It's got a co-working space and a fitness space and they've got a Peloton bike. So I definitely utilize that a lot in the wintertime and kept up my cardio that way. So when I started training, I was actually even faster than I thought that I would be, which was really fun. And so after a couple weeks of training, I was like, you know what? If I can run a half marathon in under two hours, I bet that I can run a full marathon in under four. Which is a really lofty goal because typically, I mean, elite runners always say that the best way to run a marathon is a negative split. So it's to run the first half slower than the second half, and then it averages out. Uh, But I am not an elite runner, and that's not something I've been able to accomplish yet. And so really what I would have to do is really hold that pace steady as much as I could for an entire 26.2 miles, which is really crazy. Um, in a lot of even even sub two hour half marathoners can't necessarily do a four hour marathon just because I mean, a marathon is a beast. It's a lot. A half marathon is really taxing on your body. A full marathon is crazy taxing on your body. But I wanted to try and do it. So I decided to start going for it and to see how close I could get to that goal. So I decided to set that goal because ultimately, and this is I don't think I've ever admitted this publicly. But here it goes. Ultimately, my ultimate goal is that I would love to run the Boston Marathon. I live in Rhode Island, which is where I live is only about an hour and a half away from Boston. So it's easy to get to. It's the oldest marathon in the world. It is one of the most famous. It's really hard to qualify for. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm still a ways from being able to qualify for it. But that's the only way I want to run it. I don't, I don't want to get in the lottery, which doesn't even exist now with the pandemic. I'm not sure if it'll come back. But and I definitely, at this point in time, I definitely can't, I, I'm, I can't say I can't qualify, but at this point, qualifying is even more difficult just because of the reduced number. So we'll see kind of how those things, how that changes in the next couple of years. Um, but ultimately, I don't want to run it unless I qualify because that's part of the fun of being able to do it is to qualify. And so that would be, that, that's like my ultimate, ultimate goal. But 
a four hour marathon is a half an hour uh, slower than what I would need to to even qualify for my age group in the Boston Marathon. So that's quite a ways away. But I decided that, okay, this is the goal that I would like to go for. And it's just just a goal, right? A goal doesn't mean I have to achieve it. A goal is just something to reach for. So I decided to go ahead and reach for that goal. And by the time I got to my half marathon point in my training, so the way that I did my training, I decided the first time and the second time around that I didn't want to I didn't want to train with a coach only because I didn't want to put a ton of pressure on myself with these races. There was three years in between the races. And the first one was just my first marathon. My goal, like I said, was just to finish. And my second goal was the loose goal of being able to do it in under four hours. And so I decided that I have a lot of training in fitness and sports nutrition. That is my background. So I went to school, um, university for sports nutrition, and then I went and got my certification in exercise nutrition through precision nutrition. And I did sports nutrition coaching for several years. I was a personal trainer and group fitness instructor for several years. So I have a good idea of what it takes to train for and fuel for an endurance sport. I'm certainly not a certified coach. Um, I wouldn't consider myself qualified to coach someone else at this point. Um, Maybe that's something I'll do one day um, is to get a certification and to become a running coach. That sounds really fun to me. It's not something that I'm ready to do in my life right now. But I I wouldn't consider myself qualified to coach somebody else. But for myself... I figured I had enough experience. I've been endurance training for 16 years. I can do this. So I set up a little training plan. And I also set up a little mantra for myself as well from the very beginning, which I've been sharing with you guys on social media since I started sharing with you 15 weeks ago in June. And that is just hashtag one mile at a time. So the way that I set up my long runs is that each week I would increase my mileage starting at 10 miles. Once I got to that 10 mile point, I would increase my mileage by a mile every single week and eventually get to the point where I got to my highest mileage week and then I would taper from there. Um, And so it's a little bit different than how some coaches do it, but I like the idea of continuing to go one mile more each and every week. And so it was like, okay, I did 11 last week. I'm going to do 12 this week. I did 12 last week. I'm going to do 13 this week. And of course, things came up. So I didn't necessarily stick to every single week I went up a mile. I went on vacation in New Hampshire with my sister and her boyfriend, who happens to be one of my best friends. And so we ended up hiking up eight miles up a mountain. So I did not train that week. I did a 10 miler in the mountains, which is was a lot and really hard because uh, I live at sea level. So that was that was something that I did as well. And, and I consider that a good part of my training because it definitely it helped with the hills. It helped with the elevation um, just to help my body adapt a little bit. But of course, I only did it once. Um, so there were some things I'd, and I didn't necessarily do that every single week. But for the most part, I just increased a mile with my long runs every single week. And I did some, um, two shorter and one medium run during the week. I started running just two to three days a week because that was all my schedule allowed for. And then eventually it, it moved up to four to five days a week towards the end of my training. And I went all the way up to running 21 miles. And then I started tapering down from there. And overall, I think my training went really well. Um, So the first time I went out and did my half marathon, I ended up PRing. So PR is a personal record. And so I ended up doing that, like, uh, I think in 157. And I had just made the two hour mark when I did that uh, half marathon by myself in 2020. So it was like a three minute PR, which was really exciting. And then the next time I went around and tried to do the 13 miles, I did 14, actually. And that the half marathon time, I ended up PRing another six minutes. So I did it in like, 151 or 152. I don't have my times in front of me, but I ended up doing really well. And I was like, okay, I'm feeling good. I'm increasing my speed. And what was most important to me was that I felt good the whole way through training, that I was fueling my body really well, that I was recovering really well, that I was taking care of myself through this. Because again, this wasn't something I wanted to torture myself with. This is something that I was doing for fun, a goal that I wanted to reach, something that is joyful. And so even though some of those miles were really hard, I wanted to do it all with joy and for the love of the sport. So um, so I ended up PRing my half marathon a couple times in a row, which was really exciting. 
And then a few weeks later, um, at my 16 mile point, I had a really not great run. I don't know what it was, if it was like I just didn't fuel well, the weather was kind of icky, it was hot, I was tired, I was maybe dehydrated. I'm not exactly sure what it was. Looking back, I'm sort of like, well, I was a little bit tired. Maybe I didn't feel well enough. But it just, you know what? Some runs just aren't that great. And it just, it was not my best run. And I took to social media and I shared with you guys that it's okay that sometimes as runners, even if we've been running for 16 years, we don't have great runs. Sometimes we're going to have runs that are not the best and we're not going to feel great. And one bad run doesn't mean an entire bad training cycle. It just means one bad run. Then the goal is just to be able to pick it up and to go back out next week and to try to have a better run next week. And I did have a better run next week. In fact, I actually ended up going out too fast (laughs) the next week um, and sort of feeling a little bit gassed at mile 13 because I went out a little bit too fast, which I should have known. However... It's okay. It was better. And I learned a little bit about fueling that way. You know, I needed a little bit more fuel faster uh, because I was at a higher intensity. And all of these things were just learning experiences during the training. And so I just took them as they as they came. I smiled my way through. It was a good reminder that not everything's going to be great, but I can still love the training overall. And then from there, I had a great 18, 19, 20, and 21 mile go. Um, We ended up moving in between this, so my training got a little bit messed up during that, um, which was a little bit strange, but... I was still able to, even on odd days, um, like I think I did one of my longest runs on a Thursday morning, but, you know, it was whatever I needed to do to get it in. It went really well, and I started getting faster and felt stronger and learned more about fueling and what felt good in my body. Having IBS, um, fueling is definitely something that I take really seriously. I'm not just taking care of myself because of my past history with disordered eating, but also making sure that my digestion is is really happy throughout too. And so that was really something that I learned a lot about myself and felt really good. And I'm happy to share more about this with you guys. If you have any follow-up questions on my training or just running in general, feel free to reach out to me over on Instagram at Healthy Mama Chris. I'm happy to uh, answer your questions. And if you guys want me to do a whole running q and I'm happy to do that as well. Um, I don't know if, you, if that's something maybe I do early on in the year next year, but I can I can definitely do that. If you guys want to hear more running content, I'm happy to share it because if you can't tell, I absolutely love running. And I know not everyone's a runner and not everyone's interested in running. But for those of you who are, I would love to give you guys some kind of bonus material on this because it is something I'm, I'm really passionate about. Um, I'm an amateur athlete who's excited about running, right? Well, and I guess I have a little bit of experience there too. So that was kind of how my training cycle went. My method was one mile at a time. I started doing some speed work about eight weeks out, so about halfway through training. Um, I brought those into some of my midweek runs. And I really, like I said, I just focused a lot on learning about fueling, uh, which is something that I knew about just from my sports nutrition training. But fueling and hydration and playing with that and making sure I was really taking care of myself with that. I certainly didn't fuel myself as well last time around, I was still really healing my relationship with food, like I mentioned. And so I think I was still at the point of maybe holding back a little bit when it came to fueling myself enough that first marathon. And I definitely took to seeing food as fuel for my running. Um, And that doesn't change the fact that food is also something that is nourishment and pleasure as well, which is something I love to talk about, the three roles food plays. But when you're training for a marathon, fuel becomes really, really important. And so that was something I just focused a little bit more on, um, was just fueling myself really well and looking at food as a source of fuel as much as it is nourishment and pleasure. And then resting and making sure that I was really taking rest days and I was really taking care of myself on those rest days, lots of Epsom salt baths. Um, Oh my goodness, my massage therapist. Again, local friends reach out to me. I have the absolute best massage therapist. She is so great. She happens to be a personal friend and she has a really cute puppy that she brings with her to the massage studio. So if you're a fan of dogs and massages, reach out to me. She's awesome. Her name is Lisa. Um, And she actually had moved away during the pandemic and moved back uh, just for me just in time for my marathon training. I'm just kidding. She didn't move back for me, but it was a happy blessing that she moved back. And uh, also making sure I was stretching and doing yoga in between. I stopped strength training about probably about six weeks 
out. I still did some core work and then the yoga, which was, you know, some body weight strength. And when I'm doing when I'm saying I'm doing yoga, I'm doing like 20 minute yoga sessions, sometimes only 10, maybe 10 minutes of core a couple times a week and some yoga. And that was really mostly for the stability um, to keep up some of that body weight strength. And also core is really important for running. Um, But I really I really laid off the strength training during those last few weeks of training because I didn't want to overtrain or tax myself too much. So that felt really good to do. Um, I know that strength and stability is important as a runner, but getting that close to the race, that felt really good. And I was just listening to my body when it came to that. So a lot of focus on fuel, a lot of focus on rest. And I did have that goal in my mind, um, that four hour goal. But most of all, I wanted to have fun and I wanted to feel good the whole time, which I can definitely say with confidence that I did during my whole training cycle. So that was a really, really huge benefit. And then, of course, race day came. So a few days before race day, I really started focusing on drinking more water. That was really important. Everyone knows that hydration is important um, for racing, but drinking lots of water, um, water with electrolytes. I did have some beer with my husband because it was date night on the Friday. My race was on a Sunday before, and I had two pints of beer. And, you know, I can't say if it was a good idea or a bad idea. Um because honestly, there's probably a lot of I'm, I'm not an elite, right? And the goal was not to win the marathon. The goal was to feel good the whole way and, and have joy. And I really just wanted to have some beers with my husband. And so I did. And so some people, some elite marathoners might be like, oh, you drink two days out from the marathon. But you know what? I'm all about live in a balanced life. And so that worked for me. I just made sure I, I I hydrated extra the next day and I felt good. I didn't sleep all that great that night. And I woke up the next morning and I was like, oh, right, that's why you don't drink two days before a marathon, because you don't sleep very well. <laughs> um, and then I definitely... I tried to rest as much as possible the first couple, the first uh, or the two days prior to the marathon. I did a two mile kind of shake it out run, nice and slow, fun. I even did hopscotch in the middle of it um, on the Saturday and then just really took it easy that whole day. And um, yeah, I took the whole day off on Friday for movement and just worked and sat around and really just gave my muscles a lot of time to to rest and relax and recoup. So lots of water, lots of carbs. Um and I'm, you guys know I'm all about balance, but especially with my PCOS, I'm not someone who tends to eat a ton of carbohydrates. I don't track anything that I eat. And no, I did not track what I ate. Even even when I was carb loading, I wasn't tracking. I was just focusing on eating a larger percentage of carbs. Yes, I truly believe that you can train for a marathon. You can be an endurance athlete without tracking calories or macros. Um, and it's just about, it's about being conscious with full freedom to eat what you want to eat and to do what feels good for you. And I really focused on foods that were going to be really good for my digestion and wouldn't cause any digestive distress on race day, which I did experience the first race. I went out with some fuel, but certainly not enough fuel that first time around. Like I said, I kind of struggled with fueling enough my first marathon. And so I really wanted to have a better strategy this time around, which is why I experimented with different types of fuel, because my first marathon, I ate a bunch of goos and my body does not do well with those at all. And it went through me and I had some digestive issues on the race course. Well, not on the race course. Thankfully, I was able to make it to the porta potty. However, it definitely slowed me down. It didn't feel good. And I didn't want that to happen again. So I focused on a lot of simple carbohydrates that were easy to digest. Not a lot of raw veggies, not a lot of fruit other than bananas. My body does well with bananas. Uh, Not a lot of whole grains, not a lot of legumes. And all those things are all great healthy foods, right? Yes, but my digestion doesn't do well with those in large quantities. So I actually steered clear of those. I ate a lot of white bread because that actually feels good in my body. Funny enough, I had a huge bagel. Um, both mornings. And no, these things are not the healthiest, quote unquote, things. But when I'm getting ready for a marathon, I need to do what's going to give my body the fuel it needs and what feels the best for me in my digestion. And that felt really great. And I had no digestive struggles to speak of on the race course. It was amazing. And I'm so, so happy about that. As anyone else who has digestive issues, tummy issues, IBS, you understand. It is so great to not have digestive issues when you don't want them. Um, so really focused on that a couple days out, focused on eating lots of carbs and fueling my body really well in that way and uh, and just resting and drinking lots of water. And so then race day came and I woke up at four o'clock in the morning. I had gathered all my stuff ahead of time and all I really did in the morning was go ahead, use the bathroom, drink some water with electrolytes, had some oatmeal, didn't put anything else in the oatmeal, literally just 
plain oat, well, it wasn't plain oatmeal. It was um, cinnamon raisin oatmeal, which was yummy and added a few extra carbs in there too, which was good for me that morning. I brought my favorite Go Macro bar with me, which is my favorite pre run fuel. And so I ended up having a half of that the hour before. I'd actually planned on having the whole one an hour before, but my stomach was not interested. I was a little bit nervous. And so I decided just to have half. And then I drank some more water while I was waiting. And so I left the house at about just a little bit after 4.30, uh, got to the parking spot at about 5, got on the shuttle bus, went down to the race spot, which is right at the beach. Beautiful. So I, I had brought a book with me to read, but really I just kind of updated you guys on social media and I sat around kind of just took in the sites, um, peed like four times <laughs> just to make sure that I didn't have to go. My goal was to not have to go on the race course. And thankfully, I didn't have to um, this time around. And I was I was definitely hydrating throughout, but I think I hydrated just enough throughout, which was really nice. And I didn't drink a ton of water ahead of time, but I had um, probably three cups. Yeah, because I had two cups with electrolytes and then I had another cup and uh, along with my mud water, which is what I drink instead of coffee. It has a tiny bit of caffeine in it, but also a lot of other great ingredients that give me a little bit of energy, um, like cordyceps, which is a mushroom that I have found a mushroom extract, I guess. Well, it is a mushroom, but it's it has the, mus- the mushroom extract in it. And I find that really helps me give me a little boost of physical energy without the like ca- without caffeine, without a caffeine drop. Um, and so that was really great. I had that, too. Um, and so that's kind of what I did just before. And the race went off at 730 in the morning. I was in the the first wave um, and I put my I was kind of in the back of the first wave because I wasn't an under eight minute mile pace um and I also but I was under nine minute mile pace that was the goal and so with that goal in mind I got to the start of the race and I put on my fun playlist that I had gotten myself set up and I just reminded myself that my first goal is to finish in under four hours But my second goal was to end the race smiling. I wanted to remember the entire way through that this is something that I do because I love it. And I wanted everyone along that race course who was cheering on the racers, all the spectators to see that, to know that I'm doing this because I love it. I'm not doing this because this is torture or something this is or this is something I feel like I should do. I'm doing this because I love it. And especially for the kids who I was running by and I knew that my kids weren't going to be there until the end because we live about a half an hour away. Um, But every single one of those kids, I imagine they were my kids seeing me out there. And I wanted them to know that you can run a marathon and you can be in pain and you can still enjoy it. And so I made a commitment to myself that I was going to smile the whole way through. So even when it was tough, even there was, I I will tell you, there were some moments I was not smiling. However, every time I saw somebody on the, on the route, I give them a big old smile. And there were some really great uh, signs and things like that, too. One of my favorite was like, that's a really long way to run for a free banana. And so I just, I laughed at the signs. I laughed at people dressed up in costumes on the side. It's a really great group of spectators at this race. Um, and so I reminded myself that at the start, I put on the uh, my playlist. I listened to the national anthem, and we were off. And the first mile is essentially uphill, um, and so I paced myself. I think pretty well. I was just ahead of the pacer that I kind of wanted to stay with for the marathon, which actually ended up switching halfway through. The person switched. They kind of each took half. And so I was a little bit ahead of that. I ended up um, finishing the first mile at a good pace, but probably a little bit faster than I wanted to be. But I felt pretty good. And then mile two was really flat, and I did go way too fast (laughs) on mile two. I ran it at about 7.42, um, where my goal was to hopefully run the whole thing. Ultimately, my goal was to run the whole thing between like 8.30 and 8.45. And so this is literally a minute faster than I needed to be. I recognized that. I slowed down a little bit and I stayed pretty steady for miles three through six, um, which was like kind of rolling hills, but nothing crazy hilly. And I knew I was a little bit faster than I should be if I wanted to maintain uh, pace. And then the hills came and I was definitely underprepared for the hills because even though I had trained that route throughout the first half of my training, once we moved, I had started training my last my last five long runs, at least my last five long runs, had been done on a completely flat course. And so my body had gotten pretty used to a an almost completely flat course. And so the hills definitely took it out of me. And I don't think I was prepared for how much the hills would actually take it out of me. And so 
I slowed down a bit, which was good. I needed to slow down. Um, and so then I slowed down by mile seven and I held it pretty steady for miles seven through 14. Those that was the pace that I I really I was really happy with and I would have loved to stuck to to stuck to to stick to a little bit longer. Um, and then and then the wind hit. And what's really funny is I have never experienced running with wind like that before. I've definitely experienced running and having it having been windy. Uh, but my husband's a professional sailor, and I, I kind of I feel like I should understand how much wind affects us <laughs> and how harsh it can be. But oh my goodness, I did not expect how much it would slow me down. I was like 15 seconds slower on those windy miles than I was at that pace that I really enjoyed, that like 7 through 14 mile pace. My goodness, I was like, oh, I could not run any faster. The wind was so harsh and crazy. And the weather was pretty good overall. It was cloudy. It was mild. It was a little bit, um, it was a little bit muggy. Like it was a little bit, only a little bit. It was a little bit humid. But overall, it was pretty good. But that wind was intense. Um, And so even though I had checked the weather religiously and knew that it was going to be mild and good, I did not consider looking at the wind, which I will, I will definitely look at ahead of time. Because miles 14 through 19 were certainly slower, but they're still around where I wanted to be at. Um, But then around mile 19 to 20, I started to feel that first half of the race start to catch up to me. And I started realizing that I was probably not going to be able to keep up that pace for the rest of the race. And that was a little disappointing because I was like, I knew I went out too fast. And I would think I was just sort of hoping that if I had gone out that fast, then I would be able to, and I was feeling good, I'd be able to keep it up. But you know, I hadn't done more than 21 miles. So I knew that I'd be able to survive that last five miles beyond the 21. However, I I had definitely, um, especially with the hills, it had definitely taken more energy out of me and my muscles than I think I had planned for. So even so, I I still felt good. I was just slower. And so I continued to smile and I was like, you know what, maybe I'm going to be a little bit slower. But I know that I'm going to finish this. I'm confident I'm going to finish it. I'm going to finish it strong and I'm going to finish it feeling good. So then mile 20.7 happened. And what happened at mile 20.7 which was even more unexpected uh, than the mile 14 wind that picked up. And that was that I started feeling a cramp in the back of my left ankle. Now, I have not had issues with the left side of my body like at all. Uh, the issues that I have when it comes to kind of injury. And I didn't have any, thankfully, knock on wood, injuries this training cycle. Um, But I did end up with, you know, I had some knee pain here and there. And then like I mentioned, my hip pain, which also translates to some hamstring pain. So the massages help with that, just keeping my hamstring loose and not tight and making sure I was stretching and doing yoga and things like that. Um, So but any of that, that pain sort of kind of stems from my quote unquote, bad hip, like the hip that's a little bit more sensitive after having my second daughter. And so the left side was really unexpected, too. And so I started feeling this like cramping. And I was like, Oh, no, it kind of felt like when you wake up in the middle of the night, and you have a Charlie horse that beginning where you're like, No, 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 don't. (laughs) And sometimes it stops. And sometimes it continues to a full on cramp. And so I kept going a little bit longer and then I slowed down just a little bit to grab a little bit of water. And as soon as I tossed my water cup, I felt my foot cramp up and my toes curled under my foot cramped up and I had to stop. And I was like, oh my gosh, I've never had to stop on a run before. And it was crazy because I was definitely well hydrated and I was definitely well fueled. I've been fueling consistently consistently throughout. So I honestly think it was just the fact that my muscles were like, you went out too fast in the beginning and were not happy. And so so thankfully, I had this really awesome man who passed me by and he said, you're doing great. And I was like, oh, thank you so much. And I kind of shook it out. I walked for about 30 seconds and I started running again. So I slowed down pretty significantly that mile. Um, it was like a, you know, I think 30 seconds slower than the mile before that. Um, but I'm really thankful. So much of running is is mental. And just his little encouragement was really, really helpful. And so after that little cramp, I kept on going. And you know what? Honestly, it felt good. I stayed steady much slower than I had wanted to be. But I stayed steady for miles 22 to 24. Mile 25, my body was so taxed at that point. And there were two hills that came up. And they were small hills, but they were significant enough that I, I just was not going any faster. So mild, you know... Um, 
just I guess it was just before mile 25. Yeah, just before mile 25, those two hills were were a bit intense. And then after mile 25, it was flat and I was excited. I was like, oh my gosh, just a little bit over a mile. And so I hit the ground running and I wasn't as fast as I was in the beginning, but I picked it up about 30 seconds faster and I was able to make it to that finish line, smiling, feeling strong, feeling really good. No more cramps, no more issues. I felt awesome. I had a smile on my face. The gentleman who was running right behind me, um, we finished and he said, you had great intensity those last couple of miles. And I was like, thank you so much. We congratulated each other on the race. I went and I found my husband and my kiddos and my mom who came out to see me, which was really exciting because they were absolutely my biggest supporters uh, this whole time. My mom watched the kids so much so I could do those extra long runs on the weekend uh, when my husband was gone. And of course, my husband was my supporter too. And you know, as an athlete himself, he understands training. And so he he's a pro sailor. And that training looks a little bit different than endurance training. Well, I guess it depends on what type of sailor you are. But it looks a little bit different than endurance training. But he's also a cyclist. And so he understands. And so he's been really supportive through. So it was really great to be able to see them. And ultimately, I was really, really happy to end up um, really exceeding my goal of running in under four hours. So I ended up running at 349.20 and I placed third in my age group, which was really unexpected and exciting as well. I was the 25th female overall. And I was just so happy that I was able to finish that race with a smile on my face more than anything. It was really exciting to be able to reach that goal, to get one step closer to being able to qualify for Boston, to do a really tough course, and to be able to push through, even though I did go out a little bit too fast. Rookie mistake, I know. But you know what? It's all about the learning experience. And I was so grateful for the difficulties during the race for teaching me new things. And, you know, even though it was tough and even though those last few miles, I was like, yeah, I'm definitely going to take a couple weeks off. I'm still excited about my next marathon. I've already planned where I want to try and qualify for Boston next year. We'll see if my mom's okay with it because uh, my husband's definitely coming with me to this location. <laughs> we might make it a little date weekend, but gosh, I'm just... A marathon is hard. It is a beast. It takes a lot out of you. And I'm still in recovery mode right now, but I don't think I'll ever get over the high of finishing a race, whether it's a 5K, a 10K, a 10 miler, a half marathon, a marathon, or maybe you're an ultra marathoner, or maybe you're just learning how to run a mile. It's such a fun accomplishment to be able to finish every single one of those miles. And that one mile at a time mantra was with me the entire training cycle and the entire marathon. And it really was just an incredible experience overall. And so I hope you kind of enjoyed this little recap. I hope that this inspired any of you who are aspiring runners or runners already or maybe reaching for a goal, whether it's running or cycling or swimming or another endurance sport, that, you know, it's, it, it's all about the love of the sport. And I think the more fun you have doing it, even when it's tough, the easier it is, maybe not physically, but mentally, and that you can absolutely train for things and have goals and do it in a way that is joyful and intuitive and really, really fun. Um, so thanks for listening today, friends. I hope you enjoyed this. Like I said, if you have any more questions about running or my journey or marathon training or any of that, I would love for you to reach out to me over on Instagram at Healthy Mama Chris and um, definitely let me know if you want something like a running Q&A or if you want more running material this year or maybe next year. We can definitely put some more of that together um, because I think you can tell I love sharing. Okay, friends, I hope you all have a beautiful day, a beautiful week. Catch me over in the Healthy Balance Mamas Facebook group on our Friday coffee chats. I would love to see you over there. Don't forget to follow me over on Instagram at Healthy Mama Chris, and I'll catch you in the next episode. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Healthy Balance Mama podcast. If you loved it, would you take a screenshot and share it with a friend over on Instagram and tag me in it? It helps me so much to know what you love and are taking away from each episode. If you really loved it, would you hop over to iTunes and give me a star rating and review? 
Every rating and review helps this podcast be seen and heard by more women who need to hear the message of balance and wellness without deprivation. It's the best free gift you could give me. And as a reminder, the information and opinions on this podcast are meant for education and inspiration only and are not to be taken as medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Please consult with a trusted practitioner before making any changes. Have a beautiful day, friend, and I'll see you in the next episode.